Hello everybody. In case you haven't heard, Buffalo may be getting a cap over the Kensington Expressway. What's a cap like? Buffalo's Citizens for Regional Transit visited Seattle's Freeway Park to show you what a cap is really like. Hello, I'm Jim Gordon, treasurer for the Citizens for Regional Transit Advocacy Organization, which advocates for use of public transit in Buffalo, Niagara Falls, Western New York, and the surrounding region. I took this trip to Seattle completely on public transit, including taking a metro bus from my house to the Amtrak station in Depew, taking the Lakeshore Limited to Chicago, and taking the Empire Builder to Seattle and using public transit when I was there. Just to let you know, we practice what we preach. You can go places on public transit. You might wonder why CRT, a transit advocacy group, cares so much about how much New York State is spending on preserving the Kensington Expressway for 10 blocks of the city. CRT knows that there is a limited amount of money that's allocated for transit and that money comes from the total transportation budget. We want to see all the transportation dollars spent as wisely as possible. The $1 billion from New York State that's going to be used to preserve and repair 10 blocks of the Kensington Expressway is enough money to pay for Metro Rail Transit expansion to the airport and for Metro Rail extension to the new Bills Stadium that would be providing zero greenhouse gas emissions, providing economic development, meeting equity goals, none of which are met by the highway project. To be clear, that's enough money to pay for a new track, new rail cars, new rail transit stations, in other words, a complete build out of infrastructure out to the airport and to the south towns. The reason why getting rapid transit instead of a highway project provides so much more value is that the federal government is likely to fund the rapid transit with matching dollars. The Kensington Expressway project, as proposed by New York DOT, will receive no federal dollars at all. It is our understanding that the entire amount of this project will have to be paid for by state tax revenue. While in Seattle, I took this picture of a brand new metro rail station being built in Bellevue at the Microsoft campus. CRT hopes that additional funding from the state becomes available so that we don't lose the opportunity to provide service of high-speed rapid transit to all of these organizations, employers, and locations. While I was in Seattle, I wanted to take a look at the results of the Alaskan Way Freeway removal. Washington State's DOT warned against incredible traffic tie-ups and how awful it would be when the Alaskan Way was re removed and replaced with an at-grade surface road. So how did it turn out? The day I visited the Alaskan Way, traffic was completely unremarkable. There was construction limiting the flow of traffic to a single lane that was alternating north and south with a construction red light, and there was a slight delay at the construction site, but otherwise traffic was quite light. So to be sure I wasn't just misinterpreting or just happened to hit a very light moment, I went to a traffic cam and took a look at the Alaskan Way traffic on May 8th at 2.49 in the afternoon, a very busy time of day for traffic, and this is what it is. There is no Carmageddon. There is no disastrous amount of traffic as a result of the removal of the expressway. If we're getting a cap instead of restoring Humboldt Parkway, then CRT says let's make sure we get the cap right. We can look at Freeway Park and learn from Seattle's mistakes and from their successes. Seattle's five-acre Freeway Park was the first park in the United States to be built on top of a highway for the purpose of reconnecting the neighborhood. It was last renovated in 2008 and is now 47 years old. The park's safety record was tarnished in 2002 because of a slaying that occurred in the park involving a man and his ex-girlfriend. There have been no major incidents since 2002. As a result of the incident, a citizens group was formed that recommended improved lighting and security measures that were adopted and incorporated into the park. That was the only serious incident in the park's history. 
What does Seattle think of its cat? Well, in 2015, a new advocacy group called Lid I-5 formed. Their goal is to expand the park by 17 acres, making it a total of 22 acres. In December 2020, the Seattle Office of Planning and Community Development undertook an I-5 Lid feasibility study. So it seems to me that Seattle really likes their cat. There are some significant differences between Seattle's existing cap and what's planned for Buffalo. Seattle's cap is in a downtown location. It's only two city blocks long, does not require a ventilation system, has an irregular shape. When it was constructed, traditional city structures were removed, streets, highways, churches, businesses, and things. It's on a hillside and Seattle has a pretty mild climate compared to Buffalo. Buffalo's cap will be 10 city blocks long. It will require ventilation. It will be a linear park. This is going to be a replacement for a crown jewel Olmsted Parkway. Oh, it's going to be flat and Buffalo has greater temperature extremes so some of the things Seattle did won't work in Buffalo. There are some distinct similarities between Seattle and Buffalo. Both freeways divided and obliterated neighborhoods that were mostly of color. They have been labeled as racist infrastructure. A cap is considered a way to greenwash a highway project that's mainly for cars. And Seattle's I-5 and Buffalo's Kensington Expressway both made the Congress for New Urbanism's 2021 list of highways, highways without, without a future. A future. This is one of many views of the park we will have in this presentation. One thing Seattle got right was wayfinding. Signage is good and helpful. Freeway Park is bracketed by Seattle's brand new convention center and its old convention center. The new convention center is shown here. I recorded this view of Freeway Park from the new convention center. Another thing Seattle gets right is signage that reinforces the public's right to use the park. No person may be asked to leave for any reason other than conduct that unreasonably interferes with the enjoyment of the space by others. For safety, call stations are placed around the park. Crashes are more frequent in tunnels. To make the crashes less calamitous, the speed limit is reduced. Freeway Park consists of large planter boxes placed on a bridge over the expressway. There are some beautiful plantings within this park. I don't know what Seattle was thinking when they chose the brutalist style for the Freeway Park. Brutalism is what you get when a psychopath is given an architect's license. This is supposed to be a comfortable park bench. This staircase is brutalistically unwelcoming. Why this ledge is unprotected, I have no idea. The clash between brutalist style and the beauty of nature is striking. This sign proclaims that $10 million has been allocated for cosmetic improvements to Freeway Park. The cap also covers a parking garage in addition to Interstate 5. 8th Avenue is the only city street that crosses the park. I was surprised by two things. First, that there are very tall trees. Some of the planters are over one story tall. Second, I was surprised at how noisy it was above the interstate inside the cap area. There appears to be a design flaw in that several of the planters cannot be reached for maintenance purposes.
There is a lot of beauty in the park, but bring your earplugs. The roar from the expressway is very noticeable. Bathrooms are a problem. There's no money to maintain them, there's no money to clean them. They officially are closed, but they act as public latrines. And if you look at the right-hand side of this picture, you'll see that there's a man there with his pants down. The stench is very strong. There doesn't seem to be any responsible party for maintaining the cap area. In this picture, we see a person reading on a ledge, and there's two scooters. Let's look a little closer. The scooters appear to be abandoned. The abandoned scooter is in what used to be a fountain, but now is just a scum pond. There is attractive public art in the park. It appears that some person or entity has taken it upon themselves to maintain this one section of the park and it looks great. The lack of some basic maintenance, just calling a plumber to unclog a drain, would make the park so much better. Buffalo can learn from Seattle's experience. Getting 55 million federal dollars is going to give us a lot of garden. We've got to choose the right landscape architect, stay away from brutalism, and think about the various possibilities for a Victorian garden. And don't forget, focusing on the garden is a diversionary tactic. It's being used by DOT to keep us from focusing on the fact that they're really spending a billion plus dollars just to maintain 10 blocks of expressway. It's important to plan right now. A Victorian garden is expensive. We need to know who's responsible for keeping it up. The City Parks Commission? A state park? A citizens advocacy group to oversee the park? Who's going to pay for the Victorian gardens? Who's going to hire the arborists, the horticulturalists? Why isn't there a greenhouse in the plan? We need to know who will be accountable and who is responsible for the upkeep of this park once it's built. Don't leave this up to anybody else. Before a shovel hits the ground, get involved with the community. Be involved with the planning process. Make sure the state of New York doesn't dictate to Buffalo what kind of garden we're going to get. Make sure that we can get the garden we want and that we can make it sustainable. One thing is for sure, if you care about the outcome of the cap, become involved with the community, get involved with the planning process, and do it now. Thank you.